And, and overall, you know, the mental health industry overall is in crisis. Like, you know, people are because of a lot of reasons, probably one of the uh, main factors maybe is the social media and stuff that people are getting lonelier and lonelier. And when you immigrate and you come to a new country, you lose all of your belongings, your connections, your friends, the city that you were known, you know, everything. Like I've, um, I, I, I remember one time a person told me, you know, I just want that moment that I came out of my house and say salam to someone, mm -hmm. not hello or hi, you know. Hello and welcome to The Ally Show. My name is Ali Aslamifar and I'm your host for the show. We are here with our episode number seven where we are chatting with Nasibe Amiri. I got to know Nasibe when I was looking to find a therapist from my cultural background and a friend of mine introduced us and I not only was able to find a great therapist from her service medinfinite.com but also I was able to find a great friend, Nasibe. In the past few months, she and I have been talking and discussing a lot of interesting mental health topics, and I thought it would be great to bring her on the show, and we really appreciate that she accepted the invite and joined us in this episode. A little bit more about Nasibe. She's the CEO and the founder of medinfinite.com. She has a PhD in electrical and computer engineering, She's a mental health advocate in the diaspora community especially, and given her experience as a member of this community, she knows it firsthand that how hard it's been for immigrants and the diaspora community to find a therapist that understands their culture. In fact, that's why she founded medinfinite.com, which is an online marketplace to find therapists that are matching your cultural background. This is not a paid advertisement, but... I personally use this platform, and that's how I got to know a great therapist who actually understands my background. If you are from the diaspora community, especially my fellow Iranian friends, you can use the code ALLY15, A-L-L-Y-1-5, to get your first four sessions of therapy with 15% discount and use all the other benefits on this great product. We'll put the code and the link to the website in the show notes. In my conversation with Nasibe, we are talking about mental health issues caused by cultural reasons or events, such as the war between Iran and Iraq that both of us as a kid experienced back in Iran. If this is a sensitive topic to you, please skip this episode, and we hope to see you in the next episodes of The Ally Show. Also, if you are suffering from any mental health issues, we highly recommend you to contact your mental health, or medical experts to get the supports you need. The best way to support this show is by following us on wherever you're listening to your podcasts and subscribing to our channels. You may also review us up to a five-star review and share us with your friends that you know they need such content. Similar to all the other guests that we have on the show, Nasib also has an uh, accountability campaign. She is recommending journaling for 30 days. If you'd like to join her campaign for 30 days, the link is in the show notes, and she will be sharing a little bit more about this practice in the end of this episode. Now, without further ado, let's start our conversation with Nasibe Amiri. Thank you for having me, Nasibe. We are here with Nasibe Amiri. The story that we actually got to meet each other first time is really interesting, and I think it's really uh, related to this discussion and why I'm excited to talk with you today. We got connected through a friend of us, Aydin, very old friend of mine. I already had a couple of podcasts with him recorded on my Farsi podcast. Aydin, hi, if you're hearing us. Uh, he... He connected us originally so that I can get service from your platform, MedInfinite. Uh, I was so frustrated finding 
a therapist that would understand me and he's like do you want to uh, do you want me to introduce you to Nasibe like and he did it we got uh, on the call and then we were supposed to meet for 30 minutes but we ended up talking for like two and a half <laughs> hours starting the conversation with the fact that we are half Kerman Shahi, <laughs> both have Kurdish. I'm going to stop talking, but I'm so excited to have you. Again, thank you for hosting me today. I I'm so excited to have this conversation in person. Hi, Ali. Thank you so much for the great intro. I'm, uh, I'm very excited uh, to be here and hosting you. And it's my honor. So if I want to introduce myself, I'm Nasibe Amiri. I am, um, I am half Kurdish, as you, <laughs> as you mentioned. So I was born in Kerman and uh, I've actually uh, older than you, so I've actually went through war as well, like Iran and Iraq war. So I was there, and um, that's also like you know I remember some scenes, like you know, wow. I'm, yeah, like seeing like um, you know bombs in the in the sky, you know, coming down and everything, and um, the the street that we used to live uh, in Kermanshah Farhangian, a lot of houses like were bombed. Wow. So like yeah, like like. Um, two neighbors, you know, on the right, three on the left, you know, wow. a lot of them. And usually I don't know why we did that, but after that we were like, go and watch like, you know, what happened. And so I remember those scenes. So. But anyway, that was like one of the reasons that move, we moved out of Kermanshah and we went to Mashhad. But, but we did that later, you know, during uh, the war, we were going uh, out like uh, sometimes living in uh, Qaimshah, which my mom's uh, family were there. And uh, later, sometimes we went to Mashhad. I also have some relatives in Mashhad. Anyways, uh, so we ended up living in Mashhad, like when I was like in um, maybe 13 years old, I think, yeah. Uh, so that's a story I told you because uh, I wanted to say that I, um, it was not uh, that hard for me to, uh, to immigrate, you know, out of Iran and come to Canada because I didn't have that feeling of belonging to, you know, anywhere I used to live, you know, very early age, like in Kermanshah, in Hamadan, because we like, mm -hmm. it was like bombing. So we went to other cities, you know, like you have to, you know, get away from the city and uh, to Qayyam Shah, to Mashhad, everywhere. <laughs> so in, in Tehran, to Karaj, so everywhere, everywhere that we had family. So we were go there and stay with them for a a couple of weeks or months and then come back to Kermoshah. Uh So yeah, that was my story till I immigrated in 2008. I came to Canada to study my PhD. My background is in electrical and computer engineering. And so, yeah, so I did like after that, I went to work and, you know, did a lot of work and stuff. Then, uh, you know, um, so I, I bought my PhD. I had a great relationship. I went to work. We bought a house. We had like a car. We had everything. And I brought my family to Canada. So I had a family there too. I pretty much had everything at some time, like, uh, you know, like pe the stuff that people are looking for, like, you know, money, friends, like my family was there. I was like not uh, missing them that much and uh, everything. So, but deep down, I was like, you know, thinking that something is missing. If this is life, I, you know, I, I'm looking for something more. Like I don't want my life to be like, just continue doing this work, you know, like whatever it is, if it's managing like the people or building like, you know, softwares and whatever. Uh, or even doing like some energy projects, like, you know, like multi-billion dollar projects, but that was not satisfying for me. Uh, so then uh, I, uh, you know, deep inside, I was looking for myself, like to add happiness to my life and how can I do that? And I made that a mission for my life to, to make myself happier and to make other people happier. So that's how Med Infinite came up. <laughs> I have more story into that, so we can talk about it. But MedInfinite is like an uh, online mental health platform uh, focusing for diaspora communities. And uh, we are connecting people to, you know, therapists and psychologists who have the same background, uh, cultural background, and understands you, how you have been brought up, and, uh, and know your language, your mother tongue language. And uh, this is, to me, is the difference between being heard and being understood. Mm -hmm. Being heard versus being understood. Do you want to elaborate on that? Because I think that, yeah. that there is a lot yes. packed under. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, like 
because sometimes you think that uh, the issue is like a language. That's like I want to say it's not a language because a lot of us who have immigrated, you know, a long time ago, or a lot of people right now, even in Iran and other cities, they know lang like English language or, or the language that uh, of the country. They learn it. Or even, you know, there are a lot of tools. There are translators. There are a lot of AI tools now. You know, you can <laughs> communicate definitely with anybody you want. But that's just the communication. They hear you. They understand the words. But to have a deep feeling of what you've been through and what each word means, that doesn't come only with, you know, the translation and hearing you. So that's the issue, I think, like the immigrants and the diaspora community um, feeling in the new country that they choose to live. So they are, um, they have a huge burden of what happened to them, you know. Usually, you know, you had a lot of traumas, everything, uh, a lot of challenges, and you've decided to go to, you know, choose another country as your, as your new home. But I think that should not limit you to where you can get. Mm -hmm. I love to empower people. And that's like one, uh, one approach to that is to, to help them to be in a better mental state so they can achieve whatever they are looking for in life, you know, whatever they, they left a lot of things behind and came to a new, new place. But when you get uh, through the challenges in life, like uh, uh, so, some, some unique challenges spe uh, specific to uh, immigrants and some overall challenges as a human, yeah? And you're seeking help uh, here, for example, in North America, like 70% of uh, mental health uh, service providers are white. They have the knowledge, they may be able to help you, you know, to some extent, but deep inside, you don't get that deep connection with them, you know, so to that understanding. So like, for example, when we start talking, when I said I'm from Kermansha, it's a lot of information, yeah? So we just connected at that time, like, we had a great conversation, but we just connected, you know? If I say, for example, I went to this university, if it's the same as you, you know, I've been living in this city, it's a lot of information coming with that. But with the therapist who, who doesn't know your background or who didn't live that life that you experienced, they may have the knowledge, just like some science, you know, some steps, some helping, but to get through the, to, through the effective therapy and, and the treatment that you need at the end, that stops at some point. So you cannot get that help from, you know, anybody. It's better to have like, to connect with a person mm -hmm. with the same background. I think this story you opened up with, I, I was shocked. I, I didn't know, actually, you, you were in Karamasha during the bombardment. Mm -hmm. But I hope this helps the listeners to also understand those who don't know the stories about the eight years of war in Iran, which impacted a lot of our lives. Mm -hmm. Like, I was born during the, uh, during the bombardment of Tehran. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I was I was impacted in a different way and you but again this is the cultural chaos it's mm -hmm. not even trauma it's the we are born and raised in chaos some of us who are who lived that era and those who are born and raised in this era they are going through another kind of chaos that the northern american uh, practitioners the european practitioners they're not going to even understand it mm -hmm. it's nothing to blame but i think this these kind of stories become more and more important for practitioners to know so that somehow they either should empathize to, to start like understanding how to empathize with those situations or start like understanding that I cannot handle this patient. Mm -hmm. I need to refer them to someone else. Mm -hmm. Like I the story and that's how I got to know you. The story that I was going through was like I was thinking that I'm so aware of my mental health issues, mm -hmm. right? I've been going to like a therapist. I, I use so many different services online, in person. Most times my therapists were white Americans. And as soon as I was talking about like the fact that like I was born during the war, mm. my family was like this, my dad was like this. All I was seeing, like I, I was just feeling that there is no empathy coming out of it. Like I started like questioning therapy in general. Mm. Whereas like when I started like talking to a therapist that you introduced to me and I ended up like uh, taking uh, times with her through your platform. First session, I already saw impact. And I think like that, that opening conversation you had, there's just so much to unpack there because that one big incident back in uh, early 80s, mid 80s in Iran, the eight years of war, 
created a generational problem for a lot of us that if we are coming here to this country, it has to be understood. I think you can see that probably in a generation of folks coming from India, folks coming from China, folks coming from uh, Tibet, like anywhere in the Eastern culture, I think they're all coming with different kinds of traumas that if they're coming to this, uh, to a Northern American country with 70% uh, white American uh, practitioners, it's not going to work. What is the path forward? First of all, I'm so happy to hear that uh, you're getting the benefit you were looking for from the Med Infinite platform. That was my purpose, you know, of like uh, <laughs> going through, you happy know. Happy customer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of the hassle of building that. And that's a reward for me. So now I'm very happy to hear that. So, yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is. You know, as of what we were discussing before, by 2030, more than 50% of uh, people living in U.S., uh, will be from minorities, yeah, coming from uh, other countries. And, and overall, you know, the mental health uh, industry overall is in crisis. Like, you know, people are, because of a lot of reasons, probably one of the uh, main factors maybe is the social media and stuff that people are getting lonelier and lonelier. And when you immigrate and I I you come to a new country, you lose all of your belongings, your connections, your friends, the city that you were known, you know, Everything like I've um, I, I, I remember one time a person told me, you know, I just want that moment that I came out of my house and say salam to someone, uh -huh. not hello or hi, you know. These are, uh, the, you think these are small things, but you lose everything. You lose all of the, your connections. Mm -hmm. and So this will happen for more than 50% of a population of a, you know, country uh, with the first like rank of economic, you know, in the, in, the, in the world economy. So that definitely has a huge impact in coming years uh, on overall people life uh, happiness. People are uh, immigrating to get the dream, you know, that they have, like especially U.S., you know, they uh, promise you to come here. This is a dreamland, you know, to, to get to whatever you, do, you, you didn't have or, you know, anything that you want. But these are all the barriers for you, I think. I think the mental issues will be the huge barrier for people to get to where they want. And then, you know, when you don't have a population that are, you know, productive and functional because that mental health, you know, direct effect is that you, you don't have your function, your everyday function. You cannot function at work. You have a lot of issues. It's a burden on the health you know, system and everything. So both economically and on the level of you know, people's life, this has a huge impact. So, but um, honestly, the, the solution that I thought for now is like connecting people to, you know, uh, to therapists and um, professionals from anywhere in the world, from other other locations because we don't have enough resources here for example in some cities maybe you can find you know a therapist with the same background as yourself but not in all cities everywhere like in Canada US or other countries so what is and also we are like in the shortage of resources like um, in general like overall. what's the ratio of the patient to provider uh, I think it's different in each like states, and but I don't have the exact numbers. But overall, uh, what I'm getting, what I'm thinking that we should do is like with coming all of these AI, you know, and you know all of these development and stuff. The thing that I'm going towards in future is like developing like a um, language model, which is trained based on the same cultural data. Because, you know, overall, like in therapy, uh, everything usually, even, even the current approaches that people are using were based on Western data and Western culture. You know, in Western culture, it is um, praised that like individualism is like, you know, appreciated, mm -hmm. which is not the Eastern culture. And, you know, when you get to therapy, it's like what, you know, they try to... Uh, to convince you that it's better, you know, you're better off if you only f think about yourself and, you know, help yourself. It may help you to some extent, but it's not the solution for everybody. 
And the issue is that even, you know, all of these um, development, you know, ChatGPT or whatever, like that comes, you know, every day is even those everything, uh, all the data is just the Western data. There are new researchers com coming out that shows that, you know, how biased these language models are or even even the approaches when talking even the, you know, so I think for future, we have to um, take advantage of uh, technology, but we have to, to ensure that we bring like, you know, this culture aspect to, to the learning and, you know, developing this. This is for future. For now, I think uh, the platform, something like Made Infinite can be helpful for people because mm -hmm. we are specifically looking for, for example, you know, connecting you with the, with the same person, you know. From your knows, culture yeah, from or your similar culture. cultures. You mentioned like it, it's impacting the economy. In 2030, it's going to be 50% minority. That means 50% of the workforce is mm -hmm. also going to be that. I think there's one thing to be said, and I think we talked about it earlier, that even in different organizations, mental health issues are treated differently. Mm -hmm. Like I've seen, I've seen cultural responses in one organization being taken as something to be worked on, something to be coached, versus in some organization being the purpose to get fired. Like, I think that, that's, that's one of those stories that has to be told, and I'm, I'm taking that responsibility right here. I've seen it in orgs where folks, because of the way they responded to a specific event, and because of like taking things sometimes too personal, because things mm -hmm. were personal for us, from the traumatic background that we are coming from, from the very strict religious background that we are coming from, things will be taken seriously. And we fought so much to not be that versus in a culture, now I have to adopt to so many things. Some companies are taking a coaching approach. Some companies are taking, unfortunately, negative approach. I think that's also like something that requires some awareness, some level of awareness. How do you think about it? I know we talked a little bit, but I'm curious, like from your perspective, even your personal mm -hmm. experience, how, how, how do you think about this subject? I totally agree like with your point. This is, the, this is definitely one of the main, like very important for companies if they want like to... Um, you know, to have like more productive employees. So this is definitely what they need to look into, how they can treat different cultures, you know. Multiculturalism overall, it is uh, appreciated here, but how to really manage that? <laughs> yeah, it's not just yeah. a good a brand yeah. to say, I'm, I'm yes. hiring from all cultures. Mm -hmm. How are you gonna handle it? I think yes. that's the question. Exactly. So this is definitely a very important aspect. And if I wanted to, to talk about my own experience as you mentioned so definitely this is it like i as i said so i um, i grew up you know i think a lot of iranians grew up like with uh, parents who uh, maybe didn't give them unconditional love and then they become like a perfectionist and you know i'm not that much lovable unless i do this you know i'm not likable and stuff like that and so the same for me so i i didn't get that unconditional love so the effect of it was that even at work, if somebody is telling me or this is not right or whatever, you know, I was like getting that personal, like, oh, what are you talking about? It seems like my idea is my identity. Mm -hmm. It is con connected to my identity. If somebody is even, uh, even giving me a comment or feedback or anything, it's like they are attacking you and you have to respond, yeah? This is a normal reaction. You have to respond if you feel attacked. So, but then step by step, I learned that this is not personal. You know, you have to ask a follow-up question. Maybe they, you misunderstood that. Maybe this is not what you're hearing because everything is translating something else in my mind because, oh, it's attacking me. I'm, you know, in this situation. And then it's a natural, like, response. But I learned that uh, not through the company and culture, but I learned that through my relationship. Um, I, I really like get that unconditional love in my relationship, which like, you know, even um, with my husband, even when we get to the fight or anything, like disagreement, any disagreement, not fight. But he was just keep telling me, you know, I have unconditional love for you. This is just, we are discussing this issue. It's not something associated with you. If I tell, tell this to you, it doesn't mean that I don't, I love you less. I, I have unconditional love for you, keep it in your mind, and then we discuss this, you know. So I learned that through, you know, going through this relationship and, you know, having all of our discussions, this agreement, I started to learn that 
okay, you know, if somebody says something, it's not, <laughs> they are not attacking me. But it is very important, as you mentioned, that you, you have like a, maybe a mechanism or process or something in company as well. So you learn that there too. Otherwise, you may be seen as somebody that cannot cope with others, cannot work in a team or, you know, a lot of other issues. Yeah, at work. Yeah, this, this I hope is not out of the subject. And if it is, I think I, it's my responsibility again to call it out. Like it's really important for folks to know that the culture and the generation that went under such traumatic, and we are seeing that today still happening, not just in Iran, we see it in a lot of Middle Eastern country. Unfortunately, the war that's happening right now in the Middle East. Just think about the moment that I think the society is responsible about this generational trauma that is happening right now, that is starting, restarting right now again, war after another war. And it's, I, I don't want to just walk away from like that war trauma because I think it's one very important thing. And even the fact that we, the way that we were working out our relationship with our families, it's again because of that war. A lot of our families started being so conservative mm -hmm. after the war. They started accepting that there is a global enemy consistently trying to attack this country. There is a global enemy consistently want the bad for us. And that con uh, conservatism came into our houses. And through that lens, that's why the way we had to consistently fight with so many things. I think just imagine, and we know it, you and I and all of my Iranian listeners who've been from that generation, they know it as like their day to day. But it's really important to know because something like that right now, right now is being created for kids in Gaza, for kids in Israel. It's happening as we are talking. And if we can't stop situations like this, there's going to be a lot of bigger traumas, bigger mental health issues to deal with globally. And the kid, imagine even the kids who are even watching the news today, kids who hear about the war, they are being exposed to something that is very traumatic and this this to me is like very important for folks to understand and hear as a story and feel responsible about it I think you mentioned a really important thing. There was a situation for you that you eventually started understanding what, what, for example, an unconditional love means. And that, I think, for itself is a huge privilege. And the, the fact that you had such healthy relationship, that you could learn it through a relationship. What are the other ways that you think, like, beside the organizational, beside the relationship that you're in, what are the other ways that you think people can expose themselves to relearn, to unlearn what they learned in the past? It's very hard, <laughs> you know, to unlearn this stuff, but it's not impossible, definitely. Uh, one of the best ways is therapy, yeah? That's why I've started this. This is definitely therapy, you know, the same as um, you take care of your physical health, you go to the gym or, you know, three times. A lot of people are getting into this knowledge that you have to do, you know, exercise, you know, and take care of your body. And the same thing, I think therapy is like a gym uh, for mental fitness, really. And if you if you are trying to hit the gym, for example, three times a week, at least one times a week, it's better to get therapy. And uh, the therapist itself, it can be like that trainer, the fitness trainer, you know, that guide you, your supervisor or someone. It's not that... For some people, maybe without uh, having a therapist, they can, you know, do some self-taught, you know, look into themselves, looking in, uh, listening into great uh, uh, podcasts, you know, information. A lot of information is out there. If you are a person, you can seek those information yourself. 
definitely the information is the key. First, you, you need to have the knowledge and information. But to apply that, you need help. You know, you need help from somebody who can guide you. So that's where you go to therapy, I think. And in therapy, there are different approaches. Depends on, you know, the approach. Some of them, they give you some exercises looking into, you know, the schemas that you've, it's, it's been created through your childhood. And another approach would be like maybe looking into, you know, um, I don't know if you can unlearn it, but at least to, uh, to have a happier life is like to find a meaning for your life. I think this is like, you know, you may have, you, you may have all of the pains and everything from uh, before, but to go forward because, you know, to, uh, to, to head to the right direction or the direction that you feel it is happier for you. I think you have to sit down and convert that pain into a purpose. If you're living a purposeful life, I mean, like, um, I know that we were supposed to talk about like what is mental health. I think a, a person who has like a good level of mental, uh, mentally in a, in a good state is like a person who um, has a purpose in life and uh, who can uh, understand like their feelings and put a space between feelings and reaction and control the reaction. But this needs a lot of practice definitely to get there. But the first step is to watch it, you know, to watch your feelings. If you're angry, it doesn't, you know, it's you are not angry, it's your feelings. So your reaction can be something different. So start doing that and get help. I think get professional help is, is one of the main, main tools that is out there to help you. Well said. I, I just want to highlight what you said about mental health. And it looks like you've done it for your own life. Like you I'm found, doing it. You, right? <laughs> you found that purpose yeah. yes. and you turned it into Made Infinite, mm -hmm. which is the gra great platform it is today. I'm saying it as a user. It's not a paid advertisement, by the way. <laughs> I'm saying it as a user that the, for the great platform it is, it's providing happiness. It's helping people to also find their purpose through great conversations with the great folks you're choosing as far as like the professionals globally. Uh, and speaking of Med Infinite, I think it's it's also like important for folks to hear the story because you mentioned it uh, to me before. I think it's very interesting for people to hear a little bit of a background about this specific why Med Infinite started happening and coming to reality. If you want to share uh, that story with us, that would be great as well. As an immigrant myself, so I've seen, you know, the struggles that a lot of immigrants went through. But the inspiration moment for me was that I, I had a real, like, a close friend um, who were living in um, Europe, one of the north uh, country in Europe. And um, she was going through an illness at the time that she was not, like, uh, you know, in a great mental uh, situation. At the same time, what happened is that uh, she lost her mom at the same time. And that was like, you know, like a huge trauma for her, which is, I think, for everybody, this, of course. Uh, at that time, like we wanted to help, but, but at the same time, I, I felt guilty that I'm not even there for her, even to give her a hug. You know, we, I was like in Canada and she was something somewhere else. And then COVID hit and you couldn't travel. Even like we were, tr we were trying to plan, you know, to go there and we, be with her at least for a couple of days, but we couldn't even do that. So I felt a huge guilt burden. And at the same time, we were trying to convince her to see a therapist, you know, you have to go talk to someone, you know. But the thing is that, and she did that, not that she did that, she did that, she went to a therapist in the country that she's uh, living in. Um, but she came to me and said, Nassiba, they don't understand me. Like I, when I tell them that I'm the only daughter in this family, I'm like the only daughter of my mom. So we had that kind of relationship. They don't understand me. Like, it doesn't, you know, it is, um, it, it doesn't have any benefits if I talk more because they don't get it. They don't get it. So every time uh, she went to a, like a therapy session, come back, like they don't get it. And that was the moment for me that I understood uh, like the importance of cultural and understanding, you know, how you have been brought up and what type of con uh, family, you know, uh, what was the culture in that family and all of this. And then I started to, to research and, you know, do... Uh, my own research on that and uh, first we tried to find a good therapist like from Iran for her like which was like not easy at that time 
and uh, we went through a lot of ups and downs and I think she started a couple of sessions but then she didn't continue you know finding a right therapist is very hard so that was the moment and then I started to yeah review and do a lot of uh, interviews with people from other cultures so I, 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 I talked to my friend from Colombia and they said the exact the same thing from people from Mexico, Peru, Ukraine, like even Romania. Even here, like um, a, a person who um, immigrated a long time ago and their uh, like kids were born here from Italy. They told me the same thing. They said we couldn't find somebody like, you know, we can connect with. Like I, I really like to so find a therapist like who, uh, you know, my, my um, teenagers can go with. But, you know, they can have a good uh, connection and understanding. Even they are a second generation here, but they have the same issue. So after all of this, yeah, so I started to, to look into building MedInfinite. That's, that's an amazing story in a way that, I can just say it from a product perspective, mm -hmm. like the, the, the problem is very clear. You caught that very clear problem, took it out, and now, okay, what can I do for this problem statement that I'm so passionate about? And you did the research. Like the fact that it's, it's very interesting, the fact that you came out of your fixated p potential place that you could be fixated. You could be just like, oh, yeah, I'm going to just build a, build a platform that works for my Iranian folks. You could just say that. and But no, you expanded your research and you validated your hypothesis that, hey, Colombians, Ukrainians, all, all of these other nations who are uh, uh, immigrants or from the diaspora community here, they feel the same way. This is a big problem. Mm -hmm. that, that is a small problem. Then now you also proved it that it's already a big problem and I want to solve it. It's so fascinating and uh, I love I love that passion. Now, what is the next step for Med Infinite? Like, where where do you think you should be headed to solve this big problem? Mm -hmm. This is a big big question. This is a billion dollar <laughs> this question, is exactly by the way. Billion dollar <laughs> question. So I was talking, you know, with these uh, like uh, visionaries, like from Pair VC and others. Like, I wanted them to help me. Where where should I go? I mean, to scale because you know that's like a huge problem, as you said. And I've actually started to um, hire some um, uh, therapists from uh, Colombia and other other Spanish language. Uh, countries because you know uh, my platform right now it is open for Farsi speaking people uh, but you know to go to next market if we want to talk business <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and talk about for example Spanish people because like we live in California so it's, uh, I think about 20 million Spanish language people here so it is the same problem for them too uh, so we started doing that, but but this is still my own question. I'm I'm still looking into where is the best uh, you know uh, the best direction to go to benefit more people. Mm -hmm. You know, if I just go to you know open it for um, other cultures, is it the 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 answer or? If I go towards, you know, building, training, you know, any like uh, AI models to, to understand that, you know, now that you easily can talk to this like machine or whatever, <laughs> maybe they can help you. But I think the, the, the ultimate solution is not just, um, you know, AI, because um, the thing is that we want that human connection. We don't want you, know, you just go by yourself. It, a lot of these issues of loneliness and everything, it becomes because of all of these, you know, technology uh, development and you know social media like an uh, app and stuff so we don't want to to make a, another app that you just you know uh, spend time on, on the app but something that you you can get to that uh, connection with a human or a specialist or you know or your therapist but whenever it's needed it's because you know sometimes you are it depends on the level of you know help and um, support that you need but for some t people it is okay they can do a lot of things on their own and whenever it's needed they can connect you know with the professional but uh, for some other people no maybe they definitely need to see a therapist every week or you know more than that it's it depends so i think the direction maybe is like to to identify those levels and then give them the help that they need Mm -hmm. But considering always that that cultural aspect, because I think that's that's the main thing that is missing from all of the you know services and, um, that you are getting in here, for example, or even other countries, and uh, that's what definitely I want to focus and add it mm -hmm. into any solution.
Uh, I think one question that I know it's a question of a lot of my friends, but selfishly, this is a big question for me these days as I'm working on my own projects is how can we optimize those therapy sessions technically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a great question. So definitely people can, you know, um, increase their knowledge. I think knowledge would, would add a lot to you, you uh, in any aspect. But uh, one main, main thing would be, you know, to, to, to start to looking into yourself, I think, to go back to looking into yourself and build the relationship with yourself. People are in different levels, so I cannot say, you know, everybody can do it, you know, at, at first. But it's, it's good to start looking into yourself, you know, to reflect into yourself. Do, 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 do the stuff that is like if you look anywhere, they will um, suggest you to do. Start journaling, for example, writing, you know start to try to bring what is on on your unconscious you know bring it to conscious mm -hmm. and then to start realize okay what is the problem if you find the problem maybe you don't um, exactly find the problem you need the help but you know that you have you need help in some issue and then you go to therapy and other than that one other main thing in mental health i think is like uh, being con connected to the board and being present in whatever you do, for example, if you're working, you know, engage with your work, like know exactly what you're doing. If you're talking with someone, being present, you know, have that discussion, understand it, I anything. If you're walking, you know, being present at the moment. So overall, this would be, I think, being present and being uh, mindful. Yeah, that I think is a great step. If you start doing that, even if you go therapy to therapy, definitely, one of the first approaches maybe is to start meditation and doing being mindful. And then when you are trying to do that and, you know, being present, I think you start or, or write, writing and journaling, you start to get a lot of information from yourself. I totally agree with you. When you start like writing or even drawing, because I know mm -hmm, some folks mm -hmm. like to draw or sure. doodle, it, it just, a word comes out of your head and you're like, oh, that was it. So I can just put it in a parking lot for now, do my work, and maybe find a therapist to continue discussing mm -hmm. what I just found out by doing this journaling or doodling. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really interesting. It gives you things to work on later rather than mm -hmm. to be busy with. Uh, I, I did a lot of journaling back in my uh, grad school thanks to my mentor who kind of forced it to us. Like mm -hmm. he, he, he told us, buy this uh, notebook mm -hmm. and every day write one page. And he was collecting it. He was not looking at it per se, but he was collecting it to make sure everyone did it. Just like, like back in like high school mm -hmm. or even earlier, like dude, our, our teachers were collecting our notebooks to see if we did the assignment. <laughs> he, he was doing that. And I think it, it was very interesting for me to force myself for a while and it started like, and I was going through a lot of like uh, emotion during that time for so many reasons. And I started like figuring out, okay, this is not that bad. I, I was able to put it on paper. I was able to put my, some of my emotions on paper. Great, there is a parking lot, this and this notebook, pretty thick. There is a parking lot for, for it already. I can work, it, work on my thesis. It was just, a, and I didn't have even time nor money mm -hmm. to do therapy at that time. That was the best way for me to have a parking lot of stuff so that I can work on it later. So I think what, what you were saying about journaling is really, I just, I just wanted to echo this. It's really helpful. Um, and I've seen it working for my own life. Is there any specific type of journaling that you would recommend? To start, you don't need any specific. You know, mm. there are some some journaling you can find outside that they ask you a question every day that you can write about it. If you don't know what to write at all, if you don't know, you can get help from them. You know, they ask you, you know, or, or gratitude journal. Maybe you can start from gratitude journal. Just write some, you know, like three things that you're grateful for today and then next day. That's one, one way of starting doing it. If it is uh, hard to think about what to write about, you can, you know, uh, get some hints and some questions to write about. But honestly, other than that, if um, you have, you know, you, uh, you're, um, you have a lot of things, you know, in the background of your mind and thinking and don't let you focus on your job, if you bring it out and write it down, whatever it is that you're thinking, even at the moment that you just want to write, 
whatever in, is in your mind, just write it down. You know, this is one way. I think when you start it, it you can, you can find the, your way. You know, what is uh, more uh, effective for you. So, but That's I think awesome. any of this, like if you answer questions or do anything, any any um, any way that you started, it, it's going to be beneficial. Absolutely. So this is a this is a question I always love to ask folks, even though that you already touched on some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you're doing a lot to help people to stay mentally sane. You're providing a service. You you think about it on a daily basis. What do you do for yourself? How do you keep your own mental health sane? Like if you want to package it, or if it, if you want to. Uh, share some of the biggest one with folks who are listening. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I, I think we talked about some of this, but for me, one of the uh, most important one was to find my purpose in life. You know, that I, I put that mission in my life that, you know, I want to help others and serve others. So I was listening to some podcasts yesterday um, and listening to uh, Arthur Brook. He's like, a, yes, he's like a Harvard professor. And he is uh, teaching happiness, you know, how to how to live a happy life. And uh, so according to him, and I learned that the four things that people think that they need, but this is not really what they need, is like money, power, fame and pleasure. But this you, you need to use this towards the four pillars, which is important to your life, which is faith, friends, family and work to serve work as a service. So I think for me, that work as a service was missing. That's what I find out, you know, because I wanted to be impactful. I wanted to have like a, a, some effect in people's life, with, which I can see, I can relate, you know, I can connect to people. So I wanted to serve people. So that was missing. So I changed, you know, I changed my life. I made this project for myself and then I brought it to life uh, so I can, um, I can um, change, you know, uh, a lot of people's life. But other than this, and this is important because, you know, when you do some work and you say, why, why am I doing this? Why am I in this meeting? You know, a lot of times, like when you're bored from what you're doing, but when you have like a purpose, you know why you are do doing this. You know why you have this meeting. You know why you're talking. You know what. So that's like make everything more pleasant. I think that's, uh, that was the main thing for me. But other than that, uh, I love to be connected with nature. That was always like um, I used to go hiking a lot or even camping. And I suggest backcountry camping. When you go like backcountry camping and, you know, get at least one, two days like off the grid. <laughs> that's like uh, where you start uh, thinking, you know, and see the main needs of human. You know, you think that you need a lot of things when, when you go like to backcountry hiking, you say, oh, I don't need any of this. You know, I just need to be alive. And that's like, you know, making the food. That's like a huge chunk of the day is just, you know, when you go find the water and you come here, you know, make some food to eat and being alive. And so connect, being connected with nature is, is, is one of the main ones, I would say, and walking. So sometimes we go like to nature walking and sometimes in San Francisco where we do uh, just urban hiking and walking. So pretty much um, everywhere we go in San Francisco, we walk there. Like even if it's one hour or like one and a half hour, we just walk there. And walking is, I think, very important. Even during last year, you know, um, the Mass Aminis movement. So what helped me a lot uh, to stay focused on, you know, what I'm doing is was just walking. So sometimes when you're just going out and walk for three, four hours or five hours, just walking and come back. So that's, I think, for me, these are all the tools that I try to use. You said something about like serving others per, uh, and uh, it's so interesting. And I think in my perspective and in my experience, it's, it is such a great psychological trick that by serving others, and you said it very well, because you can see it, you can see the impact. I think it kind of like subconsciously, it gives us a hope that if it's working on others, it's also working on me. We're kind of like projecting what success we can help. For example, if I'm helping with some, someone's mental health, if someone tells me, hey, Nasibe or Ali, by when you did this, that saved my life, 
you are more hopeful that I can also use the same thing myself and it's helping me. For me, it happened when I was doing the meditation podcast and st I'm still doing it in Farsi. And I think it was like right around episode 17 or 18 where I started like figuring and seeing that, oh, it's working on other people. Oh, it can work on you. My voice even mm -hmm. changed. Like a starting episode, I think I told you last time we met, my voice started changing episode 18, 19 because I started loving myself. I started like figuring out and seeing that self in me. And I'm like, if that worked on them, that should work on me. Like I've done meditation for years, but honestly, the only time I actually felt it working was starting episode 18 of season one. Another usual question we, we love to ask our Yes, is, and I, I, I believe in this a lot. Um, if we are saying, let's do something, if we are promoting something, we should do it ourselves first. Like if I'm telling my audience in, in the Farsi podcast, let's do 10 day, 10 minute challenge of meditating and not eating added sugar, I should be the first one doing it. And, and it works, it again works for me more than anyone. I want to know if there is any activity that you would like to do with our audience or you would recommend it so that you also do it and then they can also do it with you at the same time. I wanted to offer therapy, but, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's not something that we can offer to everybody. But I think journaling would be, I would say, start journaling, you know, start mm -hmm. writing. Um, start writing every day maybe just put an alarm or something for yourself like at, in the morning or at night like before any time that works for you just five ten minutes that's it you know you don't need to you, you say oh I don't have time you know I'm too busy no just uh, just ten minutes start you know just write whatever is in your mind and make that a habit if we can make that a habit then down the road you can see the uh, benefits of that so maybe I commit to that Yes. There we go. Yeah. So <laughs> we are going to have you committed for 30 days to mm -hmm. journal. And whoever who wants to uh, join an SE before this challenge, we'll put a link on the show notes. They can also join that. I, I also wanted to, and this is, this is one thing that's been working for me, even, even still recently, I'm trying to add more new atomic habits per se uh, or routines to my day to day. I think one thing that with journaling it helps is just put one notebook next to your bed and pair that with you waking up or going to bed. Before going to bed, that that becomes like this atomic habit for you to take your notebook, write a few lines, close it. When you wake up, write it, close it, put it again next to your drawer if you have anything next to your bed. Just keep it next to the bed. Keep it under your pillow. It's there. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do anything else every time. And I think that pairing is also helping a lot to turn that to a habit. Is there any final thought, anything we didn't discuss, anything you like to share with the audience or anything? Thank you so much for the conversation. It's just one point. People sometimes is like, mm, it's like kind of a misunderstanding that, okay, if you are in a good mental health, you know, uh mentally in a good level it's like you don't ever get sad or you don't feel uh, unhappiness or you know you don't angry or you don't f fear of something it's not the case you definitely you know right now i'm saying oh i have the purpose i have this i have that i i help myself to be in a better um a better situation but it is not that i don't get sad i definitely get sad sometimes you know i have all of those feelings uh, but the important thing is that, is that to learn something out of it and grow, you know, and grow and put your efforts in the direction that you want. I think that's important to know that if people think, oh, why I'm ha unhappy today, it's not something wrong with you. This is human, yeah? You, you have all of these feelings and you definitely, it's not that you can eliminate some of them. It's not like that. So that was the point that I think I wanted. It is important to know and understand and for everybody that uh, everybody has all of these ups and downs every day. Since you brought it up, I want to know if you have any thoughts on like how to catch those moments. So um, one main thing for me is that, you know, if I'm sad, I'm sad. I don't try to make myself, you know, mm. out of it immediately. I just take some time to feel it, you know, like 
okay, my hands like not the whole day or like, <laughs> but at least, you know, like half an hour, okay, or one hour, you know, I feel sad. Yes, I'm unhappy. Maybe after some time goes, you can think about the reasons and what happened and, you know, if you can help yourself in any other way. But I think one way is just don't be afraid of it. If you're sad, you, ha you are sad, you know. If uh, Maybe there is a reason you can find about it later, but at the moment, I, I'm not against it. Sometimes I'm just, I know that, you know, I, it's a lot of, it's a huge burden on me or anything, or I'm overwhelmed. I want to cry, I cry. I, I'm not like, you know, trying to fight with it. Mm -hmm. I, I take it. And then, and then, you know, after the, after I cry, I have better feeling, you know, okay. I can think about it um, productively, maybe why this is it. Or if anything happened that um, at first I misunderstood it or that had like um, makes me angry or sad, then I can think about solution to that, you know. But after that time, I think I, you need to take that time of just feel it. Our bias for having a solution, mm -hmm. like we... we... If we, if we feel something negative or to some negative per mm -hmm. se feelings, uh, we quickly want to like fix it. Or, oh, I'm happy. I'm unhappy. Let's go grab a mm -hmm. beer. Let's go do this like so that I'm happy. Yeah. No, if you're unhappy, the way you say it for us is a good reminder that if you're unhappy, just feel the unhappiness. Just let it, give it, a, give it a time. Give it like a few minutes, a few hours. Feel it, experience it observe it mm -hmm. exactly and then exactly. okay next time here and is for me one thing is that i don't know if this is this works for everybody or not but if i have a bad day i know tomorrow is another day this always i remind myself like you know okay tomorrow i start again you know i, I but i let today be a down day like i have like some downtime today but tomorrow i start again it's always was well, on the, my, my mind that tomorrow is a new day, is another day. That's a so. great affirmation for end of the day. Every time, <laughs> if you're journaling, end it with like tomorrow is another day. Thank you so much. If there is nothing else, uh, we can end the conversation here. I would love to hopefully have you later, maybe next year again on the show and see and hear about the progress of MedInfinite. I wish you and the company and your family best things. This is, as we are recording this, this is December 1st. We are almost end of the year. So I think when we are going live with this is after the new year. So happy new year to those who are listening. Happy new year and happy holidays to you and your family. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for hosting me. I enjoyed this conversation. I hope like the audience also enjoy it. And yeah, I would love to come back and talk more. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Nasiba. That was my conversation with Nasiba. I hope you all enjoyed this conversation. If you have any comments or feedback, please make sure to leave them below or email them to ali at sign the ally dot show. Once again, if you want to support this show, the best way to support us is by subscribing to our show wherever you're listening to your podcast and by sharing us with the friends that you think they're in the need of listening to these conversations. Thank you and hope to see you on the next episodes of The Ally Show.